Good morning, church. It's great to be with you again for this week's Connect Group study. Uh, this week, we'll take a look at Unit 24, Session 2, Jesus Feeds a Multitude. We'll be in John Chapter 6 the whole time. You know, I can remember as a child, one of my favorite memories was when our whole family would sit down together for our evening meal, and we'd sit and not only get our daily bread, our sustenance, but also share the stories of what had happened that day. And um, it's just great memories for me. You know, in today's fast-paced world, it seems like it's so much more difficult to sit down together as a family. Um, we're always on the go, different diets, different schedules. Um, it's just more difficult, yet, yet we still need that daily, daily bread, that daily sustenance. And today we're going to take a look at Jesus as he met the need of the daily sustenance for a mass of people. Um, as we begin today's lesson, point number one, Jesus invites others into his work of meeting the needs of people. Um, but as we roll into that, let's kind of provide a setting. Jesus had begun his ministry and had begun to perform these miracles, and the people started following him. He developed quite a gathering, and we'd like to think that they had were following him because they were committed to him. But the reality was they were only following so they, they could see the miracles. They were intrigued by him. And so Jesus and his disciples had gone up on a mountain, quite possibly to get away from this throng. And, and that's where we begin our, our, our verses today. Uh, John 6, 4. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. So when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where, where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? And so we find Jesus asking Philip this question. You know, it reminds me a little bit of when God asked, asked uh, Adam, after Adam had committed that first sin, God said, Adam, where are you? And it's not like God and Adam were playing hide and seek and God couldn't find him. Of course, God knew exactly where he was. Um, but it's as if God were saying, Adam, do you realize what you've done to yourself? Do you realize where you are in your sin and how you've affected our relationship. And so uh, when God asks a question, there's this motive behind it. And the same is true with Jesus asking Philip. Of course, Jesus knew what they were going to do. He wasn't fretting about that. The very next verse tells us he asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Um, and so sometimes, as we look at ourselves, sometimes we can uh, be find ourselves in a, an impossible situation. We have to realize God is sovereign. Um, he is in control of everything. There's not one renegade molecule out in the universe that's outside of God's control. And so with that knowledge, when we find ourselves in a difficult situation or what seemingly impossible situation, like these disciples we're going to find themselves in, we have, have to ask ourselves, why are we here? why did, Father, why did you allow me to be here? Or why did you place me here? Because one of those two things have to be true if God is sovereign. He's either placed you in that situation or he's allowed you to be there. And so we can ask ourselves, what are you trying to teach me in this? And that's a healthy way to approach a situation and so that God can, can work through that. Uh, let's look at Philip's response. Um, in, chapter, in verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. Um, and so I think it's safe to say that Philip did not pass the test. He failed the test. Um, he mentions 200 denarii. Um, a denarii was a day's wage for a common laborer. Um, and so Philip's looking at this situation. His problem is he's looking at it through a human lens. He's seeing all these people and, and doing the numbers and going, Okay, it's. I'd have to work for two hundred days to even come up with enough to, to, and it wouldn't. That still wouldn't even begin to feed all these people, and so Philip saw this mass of people, which was quite possibly as many as twenty thousand. Scripture mentions five thousand men, but when you throw in women and children, it could be as they speculate as many as twenty thousand. He saw this mass, and, and he and he thought in his own mind, he thought there's no way this can work. Um, he did the math on it, it, ran the numbers, and concluded this cannot work. Um, and this is in spite of the fact that he'd been following Jesus and seen some of the miracles. But I think that we can be guilty of the same thing as well. 
Um, I'm a numbers guy. I have a budget, a household budget, and I, I believe in budgets. I think we should have them, but I tend to get a little bit too tight with my budget and I, you know, I've all, all my spreadsheet and my columns and my, my, all my numbers add up and, and I tend to rely on that. I tend to rely more on the, on the, on the budget itself. And I take the element of God because out of it, because I'll look at something and I'll think, okay, how is this going to work? Um, and, and so I have the tendency to do, to do the same thing. I take the element of God out of it. Um, in spite of the fact that I know how God's worked in my life and, and miraculously done things that were above and beyond what I could mathematically or logically figure out. Um, and so I, I like the way Adrian Rogers would put this. He would say, the disciples were staring at a God-glorifying opportunity cleverly disguised as an impossible situation. You know, in these seemingly impossible situations, there's opportunity there for us to glorify God through him, through by having faith in him and stepping back and watching him work through this. He has an opportunity to shine. You know, we think about where Jesus was. I've mentioned that his ministry had begun and and but he was on mission. He came to to this earth for a purpose, and that purpose was the cross. And so he's on a fast track to the to the cross. And and you would think that knowing <clears throat> what was lying ahead for him, that would be consuming to him. Yet in the midst of his life here, uh, even even with that end that was coming, he still noticed the needs of the people around him. And not only did he notice them, he had a desire to meet those needs. And he did meet those needs. Um, Jesus wants to meet our needs. Um, as Pastor Travis talked about in, in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, he talked about the fact that we are a tracing, our lives are to be a tracing of Jesus Christ, a pattern of his, of his life. And so that begs the question, are we concerned about the needs of others? The book Acts asks this question, what are some reasons we fail to notice the needs of others? Um, I remember earlier this year, I had uh, an issue with my neck and my shoulder, uh, severe pain, and uh, long story short, I ended up in a, at the chiropractor and he got me straightened out. But while, while I was there, he shared that a lot of people, not just my age, but a lot of young people are coming in with a similar problem in their neck. And it's caused by this, looking down at our phones. And we're so consumed in this and to the, to the extent that we cause problems in our posture and in our neck. And, and you know, we, we were consumed in social media, Facebook, all these things. Um, and sometimes we wonder, should, do we need to, to get our heads out of our phones or whatever else is consuming us in our lives, uh, get our focus off ourselves and look around and see the needs and, and, and meet the needs. And that's certainly what God's called us to do. Uh, finally, in this point, number one, um, of course, Jesus could have created this food on his own. He, he created the universe, the heavens and the earth. He spoke into existence. So he could do the same with food. He could have spoken it into existence. He could have taken the stones and, and turned them into bread. But yet he chose to invite others into his work. In this case, he invited Philip and Andrew and the other disciples, ultimately, and a little boy with a meager lunch. Um, why does God choose to use us? in his kingdom work. Well, here's a hint. It's not because we have all these great abilities, although he has gifted us. Um, he's not doing it because of our own abilities. In fact, Romans 9, 21 describes us as a lump of clay. Let me read this. Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? And you think about a lump of clay, that's not very glamorous. Um, but in the potter's hands, there's amazing potential. Um, rolling into point number two, Jesus provides super abundantly for the needs of people. Uh, and so let me read those verses quickly. Uh, then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. Um, and so we see here... Uh, I'm trying to picture the, the disciples as Jesus is praying over this meager five loaves and two fish. And really the loaves were actually, they believe they were just actually little biscuits and then two morsels of fish. 
And so this, we, he's praying over this paltry little bit of food. And you got to wonder what's going through the disciples' minds. Okay, how's this going to work? Um, and then it, it, my translation says Jesus gave the food to the disciples and then they handed the food out. Um, and so I'm picturing the disciples and they're, they've got this, their own each basket of food and, and miraculously the basket's full. How did that happen? But yet they're still looking at one basket and they're looking at the mass of people and back at their basket and thinking, how is this going to work? But as they begin, as they're obedient and they begin to hand out the food, um, the basket never empties. You know, this is the nature of the God we serve. Um, these points I want to just kind of read through because they're really important. What might seem ins insignificant becomes significant in his hands. Whether it be our time, our money, our jobs, whatever those resources are, whatever those gifts are, there's nothing so small that God cannot use it greatly. We just, we don't need to shortchange serving God because we think that we don't have enough to offer or to give. Um, we don't need to put our confidence in what we have to offer, but in God's ability to take our meager offerings and make them useful. The Bible's really full of, of, of this very thing. Think about Gideon and his army of 300 that God pared down to 300 to face a massive army uh, and defeat that army. Think about David versus Goliath, this, this teenage boy going up against this seven-foot giant this ragtag group of Jesus' disciples who, against all odds, carried the gospel to the known world. You know, I, I have an illustration I think is very fitting here. There was this, this pianist who was a master pianist, and he played in a concert hall and filled the hall every night. And the crowds just loved him, loved to hear him play. And he grew weary. And so one night he sent his, his little young son out to play and and the little boy marched out there boldly and began, sat down at the piano and began to play. But all he knew was chopsticks. And so he began to play what he knew, chopsticks. Dun, 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 dun. And the crowd thought, oh, well, this is cute, you know. Um, uh, but when's the maestro coming out? Um, and as they grew restless, they began to, to jeer at him and, and boo him. And, and when this happened, the maestro quickly rushed out and moved around the boy and started playing this music around the little boy's chopsticks. This beautiful music, most beautiful music the crowd had ever heard. And the whole time he was playing, he was whispering in his little son's ear, keep playing, just keep playing. And you know, I think that in some way that is, is relevant to us as we serve. Uh, scripture says our, our best serving is filthy rags, the best we have to offer. But sometimes we feel like we're offering up chopsticks to God. But he's, just, he's telling us, just keep playing, keep serving, keep working. He's working something through us. He's working a, task, a tapestry that's going to be beautiful, but it's going to bring him honor and glory. You know, this is also the nature of the God we serve in that, uh, let me read uh, verses, verse 12 and verse 13. When they were full, he told his, told his disciples, Collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they, the collect, so they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. You know, so they had everything they needed and were satisfied and there were still leftovers. You know, God is, our God is not a stingy God. When he provides, he provides abundantly. How abundantly did he provide? He gave his own son for us. Uh, and Jesus in his own, own words said that he came that we may have life and that we may, may have it more abundantly. That's John 10, 10. Finally, point number three, Jesus offers himself as the bread of life who satisfies the greatest need of people. Um, as John did throughout his gospel, he's, he's revealing Jesus Christ. These miracles that he's, he's uh, writing about, that he's written about, reveal the deity of Christ. Um, and this is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus fed this multitude, and of course, but of course, and they got their bellies full. But what happened later that day or the next day, they were hungry again. And so they were looking for another meal. Um, let, me, let me read uh, this because Jesus addresses this very point. 
in verse 26, Jesus answered, truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. Um, and so naturally when they got hungry again, they were looking for that next meal. But Jesus was telling his followers, his hearers, look, don't be chasing after these things that will perish. Um, that food, that sustenance I gave you, it didn't last. You need to seek after that that eternal, those eternal things, the things that will not perish. Um, I am the bread of life. Um, when I give myself to you, it's for eternity. Um, and they should seek that. We should seek, they should seek that eternal bread that satisfies forever. Um, and that's what he was telling his followers. And he's telling us the same thing. Um, you know, we should come to Jesus not for what he can do. We, we got to come to him in faith, not for what he can give us, but for who he is, the son of God. Um, you know, if, if, if as, as part of the church body, I pray that we are seeking after God daily. We are drinking from the well deeply. Um, we are partaking of the meat of his word every day. If you're not a part of the body, if you've never committed your life to Christ, um, there, it's you just you need to do this. You need to recognize that you're a sinner, just like I am, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Have to do that first. Recognize that. Um, we need to uh, come to Christ, the person Jesus Christ. Who is He? He's God in the flesh, and uh, He's God. Uh, he's eternal. Um, in, in the beginning was the Word, and the, when the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. Um, he came to earth to live that perfect life. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1.14. 14. Um, and he did live that perfect life that we can't live. He fulfilled that for us. Um, and so we need to believe in his, his work. We need to believe in the fact that he died on the cross for, uh, for us and for our sins that penalty that we cannot pay. Um, and finally, we need to commit our lives to him. Um, and if you've done that, I would encourage you to do that. If you've, if, if you've done that this morning, uh, or if you do that later today, let the church know. Call our church and let them know because Pastor Travis wants to know that. Um, in closing today's lesson, it's, it's, been a, it's been a blessing to get to be a part of this. Let me ask these three questions. How do you need to come to Jesus in faith for a deeper relationship with the bread of life? What needs can your group meet to help people in your community find eternal satisfaction in Jesus? And how are people you know trying to find satisfaction apart from Jesus? And how can you point them to Jesus instead? Uh, thank you again, church, for allowing me to be a part of this. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for the blessing of this ministry. Thank you, Father, for the way you do provide. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who has made all things possible for us, and especially for the fact that he did satisfy uh, that sin requirement. We thank you, Father, for your goodness toward us and all your provision. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.